Hey everyone, welcome back to Reading with Raptors, another Tuesday morning. So I am in here in our kind of main classroom area with Whisper the Barn Owl. Um, she's just working on eating a few pieces of rat. Okay, something popping up on my screen. Um, so we're in here today and we're going to be reading a book about being very observant when you're outside. Hopefully some of you at least have been able to get out safely and be able to do some good nature walks, especially right now. I've been seeing a lot of news about bird migrations, especially our friends on the kind of northeast kind of coast kind of swath of the U.S. had huge migrations overnight of birds and insects. So hopefully some of you have been able to get outside. So I figured we'd read a book about being outside and being very observant outside while we're looking for signs of animals. So this is a book called In the Woods, Who's Been Here? by Lindsay Barrett George. It has these really lovely kind of full, full page illustrations on the whole book. So I'm really excited for this one. It's a big, big green page to start off with. Here's this really nice intro page. In the woods, who's been here? Looks like some kind of milkweed that's kind of drying out in the fall. It is cool and sunny on this autumn afternoon. The smell of sweet fern is everywhere. William, do you want to go for a walk? Asks Cammie. Sure, says William. Let's go. Here they are out walking on this beautiful nature trail with all these trees around. There's a dog with them down here in the corner. Beautiful fall colors just starting to come in. The children follow a well-worn path into the woods. They walk under an old cherry tree. They see an empty nest. Who's been here? So here they are looking up at this nest in this tree. He has this nest hanging down. Who's been here? Ah, a northern oriole. You can see this big hanging nest, very carefully woven, little branches and twigs and vines with three little open yelling bird mouths. And then of course, here is the adults coming in with, it looks like, maybe some seeds, maybe those are in its beak. Those bright orange and black colors. Super vibrant colors for the Northern Oriole. Cammy and William come to a big rock. A tree has split it apart and a flat stone juts out of the tree. Who's been here? Here we have this massive tree in the middle of the woods and there's this rock at the bottom of it with something on it. Maybe some seeds or something kind of scattered around on that rock. Who's been here? A red squirrel. So you can see the squirrel all fluffed up, holding a little, what looks like part of a pine cone in its little front paws. Looks like the remainder of its lunch is scattered around here on this rock. Little kind of the flakes of that pine cone. Or scales, I guess is the proper word. So here's this red squirrel. There's also on the tree a little chickadee holding, looks like a nice little caterpillar that it's found on the side of the big tree. Make sure I'm not skipping pages. The trail follows an old stone wall. The children and their dog, Sam, climb over it. A clump of milkweed plants grows in the field on the other side. Something hangs from a milkweed leaf. Who's been here? So here they are in this big open field with all this milkweed. Maybe it's kind of a little bit damp and kind of swampy during the summer, but now it looks like it's kind of dry. Those big fall colors in the background. Who's been here? A monarch butterfly. So you can see hanging on the underside of this big leaf is the remains of a chrysalis from a monarch butterfly that it would have made as a little caterpillar like this one down here with its big black, white, and yellow stripes. It would have gone in and made this chrysalis and then come out as this big monarch butterfly with the orange and black wings. 
So that's what you might find hanging on the underside of a milkweed leaf. Monarch butterfly. Cammy and William climb over a smooth gray tree that has fallen across the trail. The bark has been gnawed off the branches close to the ground. Who's been here? I love this one because they're all looking very quizzically or very curiously at this tree branch, including the dog, which I think is wonderful. They're looking at this smooth, worn down patch on the bark here where the bark is gone. It's been chewed off. Who's been here? A snowshoe hare. Look at this big rabbit, this big hare that's been chewing, I was trying to say chewing and gnawing at the same time, chewing on this big branch, getting some good fiber, some good vegetation to eat. A snowshoe hare working on that branch. Cammy finds a blue feather on the trail. Then she finds another one on a leaf and five more under a laurel bush. Who's been here? You can see these little feathers kind of scattered around on the ground underneath those leaves, kind of down in the brush. Who's been here? Well, a goshawk and a blue jay. So a Blue Jay is kind of here on the ground after being caught by this goshawk, which is a kind of kind of small hawk. They're fairly large, but they're in the Accipiter family, which means that they hunt other birds. So they're very kind of long and narrow build to sneak through trees and bushes to catch small birds like Blue Jays. So you can see all these feathers fluffing around underneath this blue jay. So you can see why this character would have found all these feathers on the ground. Usually a good sign that something was caught in the area. So there's a goshawk and a blue jay. Gray rocks break up the, or sorry, gray rock breaks up the leaf covered hillside. Something black catches the children's eyes. It is a small, dark cave. Sam runs ahead and barks at the opening. William stops and grabs his sister's hand. There are bleached bones on the ledge outside the cave. Who's been here? So here are two children and a dog looking in on this little cave, all these big rocks. And then here we have two kind of bones there. It looks like one's a skull and one's a longer bone. Who's been here? Aha. A family of red foxes and a woodchuck. So here are, here are the two kind of fox kits or baby foxes up here in the cave. And then here are maybe some adults, maybe some more kits kind of down here. And looks like someone's dragging home a woodchuck that they caught. So the bones outside of the cave might be the bones from this woodchuck that were left over that they didn't eat. Some very important predators in this woods, in these woods that these kids are exploring. William and Cammie stop beside a large gray boulder. Something strange is stuck to the rock. Who's been here? You can see the dog on top of the rocks. Two kids looking on and underneath the rocks, there's this tiny little shape. What is that? Who's been here? A mud dauber. So this is a wasp that creates these fancy little nests underneath rocks. Very important pollinators. They'll have to find and kind of make their own shelters. A mud dauber. So it makes this wonderful kind of paper material nest. An orange wood lily stands in a sunny clearing. The flower is almost as tall as Cammy. There is another stalk next to it, but the flower is gone. Who's been here? There's this big open field and no flower left on the stalk that they're looking at. Hmm, who's been here? A deer. Here's this big open field or big clearing in the woods. And here are two deer and one of them is sampling 
This lily, big stretch from our barn owl here, <laughs> of admiring those long wings. So here is a deer eating the very yummy flower from this plant. Give me one moment. I need to slightly adjust my technology here. There we go. I got a warning that it was low on battery and realized I hadn't plugged it in, which would have been bad. <laughs> Make sure I don't skip any pages. Cammie and William follow the path on their way home. The rich smell of sweet fern fills the air again. They find a basket on a blanket under an old apple tree. I wonder who's been here, William asks, but Cammie knows. Here's that big tree and a picnic basket all set up for these kids and their dog. <laughs> and here, <laughs> I hadn't noticed earlier the dog diving headfirst into the picnic basket. So it looks like a family member is here. <laughs> this nice clearing. Looks like a great spot for a picnic, huh? And that is actually how, how we end, is them finding their family member out here for a picnic. So there are some signs that people leave outside too. We know where each other are. Here are a few little details on some of the animals that these kids found in the woods that I'll read out because I think they're really good. The northern or Baltimore Oriole, an insect eater, migrates north in the spring to mate, build its nest, and raise its young. The Oriole weaves its pouch-like nest in the outer branches of willows, wild cherry, and American elm trees. Here, it is safe from tree-climbing snakes, raccoons, and opossums. Let's see if I can show you. So this was that nest that that Oriole built, is this kind of big kind of hanging nest. Very safe, makes a lot of sense. The red squirrel is smaller, faster, and shyer than its familiar gray cousin. The tiny, rich seeds found in pine cones are its favorite food. A chickadee, searching for insects in the bark of a hemlock tree, watches as the squirrel eats. So this was our squirrel friend who was eating here on this rock outside of this tree. And then, of course, the chickadee. Whoop! The chickadee eating there. The glare from the lights today. The monarch butterfly uh, has a life cycle that centers on the milkweed plant. Its eggs are laid on the milkweed's stems. When a caterpillar hatches from an egg, it feeds on the milkweed leaves, then hangs from them as it transforms itself into a chrysalis. In about 10 days, it emerges as a butterfly, leaving the empty chrysalis behind. That's what I was talking about with this milkweed plant. We have our caterpillar down here, our chrysalis here. Usually when the uh, caterpillar is still kind of inside, transforming into the butterfly, this is usually kind of a brighter green color. So if you see any that look like this, but are kind of brighter green, those are kind of still in progress. They're still a caterpillar transforming into a butterfly inside that chrysalis. The snowshoe hare's fur is white in winter and brown in summer. In winter, it eats the bark and twigs of trees and shrubs and the new growth of spruce and other pine trees. The hare's large feet help it run on top of the snow. So here's that snowshoe hare that was chomping down on the bark of this fallen tree. You can see these massive feet. The front feet are huge too. Great for being little snowshoes built in. The goshawk is a fast and fearless hawk that hunts other birds. A goshawk will catch a bird like a blue jay in the air. Holding its victim in its sharp talons, the hawk then drops to the ground for the kill. Oh, another great stretch from our barn owl here. Got to stretch the other wing. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> See those big long wings? 
So this was that goshawk that I was talking about earlier, this very, very agile, very speedy, quick hawk. Male and female foxes share the job of rearing and guarding their young, which are born in the spring. A woodchuck brought to the den will be eaten by the parents and cubs, and its bones will become playthings for the young foxes. They're kind of learning how to hunt. So this was this fox family that was living inside of that little cave. The mud dauber is a kind of wasp. The female mud dauber uses mud to build a nest that looks like a row of tubes. Then the female finds a spider and paralyzes it with a poisonous sting, stuffs the spider into one of the tubes, and lays an egg on it. When the egg hatches, the wasp larva eats the paralyzed spider. Hmm, that is really interesting. This was that mud dauber nest. So I misspoke earlier. So the mud dauber um, isn't really making that papery kind of material that most wasps do, but they're actually using mud, which I guess makes sense with their name, a mud dauber. So they're using mud. And here are the legs of that spider that it would have found and is using to provide food for its newly hatched young. It's very interesting. And finally, the deer that we saw in the book are in their summer coats, which are soft, short, and bright. This graceful doe, or a female deer, is nipping off the flowering top of a rare wood lily. So here they are in the last of kind of their, their summer colors and their summer coat. Probably here as we get into the fall, kind of starting to molt those off and shift into their thicker winter coats for staying warm, but enjoying the last of the fall flowers that they might be able to chew on. So I think, yeah, there's this last page that has these wonderful kind of trees. I love the texture of all the different leaves. But this has been In the Woods, Who's Been Here? by Lindsay Barrett George. So that was really fun because we're getting into the time of year where we start to see more, where we start to see more animals kind of moving around. A lot of them are kind of hard to see during the summer as we get to have a lot more leaves on the trees. Um, we also have a lot of kind of leaf cover on the ground. So sometimes it can be kind of trickier to spot animals out in the wild especially during the middle of the day when it's really warm. Everything's just kind of lying low, staying pretty quiet. But now, as we get into the fall, a lot of animals are shifting around, getting ready for the winter. We're gonna start to lose, hopefully not too soon, but we're gonna start to see fewer leaves on the trees. And so we'll be able to see a little bit better into those branches if you're looking for birds but you're also gonna be able to see kind of more things moving those leaves around, maybe shifting around on the ground. And then as we get, wonderful, great view for everyone. As we start to get closer to the winter, then we start to see winter tracks too. I have some books in mind for once we get into some snowy weather so we can talk about animal tracks. But I wanted to think about how we can look for animals out in the wild, um, especially as we're getting into fall. I know I've been very excited about our uh, fall migration here. I'm just gonna tip this up slightly so you can see the top of her head when she stretches. I don't know if that actually helped. <laughs> um, so I thought that this barn owl would be a great bird to talk about when we're talking about really being observant when we're outside. Because as you've probably been able to tell, and as she is right now, this bird is very observant. She has excellent eyesight for looking around, but she also has great hearing. So she's looking, and right now you can actually watch her as she listens around to what's going on. She moves her head around. She's using her kind of head movements to help what we call triangulate, or kind of figure out where sound is coming from. So I don't know what she's listening to right now. Maybe it's um, the slight noises that electronics make. We have a couple of different electronics in this room she might be listening to. I can also actually hear my own voice echoing off of different parts of the room. So maybe she's listening to the interesting echoes as I'm talking. Maybe the air conditioner, or maybe it's the heater now, but the airflow in this building, we have a couple of vents. There are a lot of things that she can be listening to because she can hear so much better than I can hear. I don't really know exactly what she's listening to. So very observant, always listening, always looking around. 
her big round face. Um, barn owls have this really kind of famously kind of heart-shaped face. But what it's doing is those stiff feathers on her face are actually helping to funnel sound back towards her ears. Because owls, they don't have these big floppy ears like we do. They just have holes on the sides of their heads. So she needs the feathers to kind of serve as her kind of ear surface to funnel that sound in. So all of those feathers on her face are actually helping to help her hear even better than she's actually able to um, just kind of sense. It's actually helping to amplify that sound, like a big satellite dish on her face. So barn owls have the kind of unique heart-shaped face where they've kind of got, it looks like almost one big disc. Whereas a lot of our other owls, like our great horned owls and our screech owls and our barred owls that we see more of kind of this far north in North America, tend to have kind of two separate kind of discs around their eyes that kind of funnel to their different ears. So a little bit different look to our different kinds of owls, but all really doing the same job of helping them to hear really, really well. Of course, she also has excellent night vision as well. So right now looking around this room, she can probably see pretty well, but if I turned all the lights off, and we just had the little bit of light sneaking in from underneath the door over here, I wouldn't be able to see hardly anything. She could still see just fine with just that little bit of light with these huge eyes, really good for kind of taking in as much light as possible. And even then, she wouldn't need her eyesight as much as I would because she can still hear everything that's going on as well. So she can hear kind of all the different things making noise in this room, be able to navigate with that as well great senses for observing with this barn owl. I will say too, this barn owl lives with us. Um, somewhat unusual for uh, to see a barn owl kind of this far north. The Twin Cities area in Minnesota is a little bit further north than you normally see a lot of barn owls. Um, usually our neighbors just to the south in Iowa see a good number of barn owls and everyone else kind of in the US um, is able to see a lot of barn owls living around and then kind of all throughout Central and South America and really all around the world on every continent except for Antarctica, you can find barn owls living all over the world. So really, really common owls kind of all over the place. But here, as we get further north into North America, especially here in kind of the central part where it gets really, really cold during the winter, it gets a little bit too chilly for them. You can see she has kind of nice fluffy feathers kind of around kind of her chest and belly. But if you look at her legs, she has very long legs and doesn't have a ton of fluffy feathers on them. It would be like if I was trying to be here in Minnesota all winter long and I could only wear shorts. I would be really, really cold and I wouldn't want to live here, but I get to put on big kind of winter snow, you know, snow boots and snow pants and all of that. And our local owls, like great horned owls and barred owls, they also have fluffy feathers that go all the way down to their feet. So they also have snow pants built in year round. So they're able to stay here just fine all winter long but usually barn owls. We might see some in the southern part of the state, but usually we don't see too many of them up here. So this barn owl uh, actually came to us after being raised intentionally by people for education, because we know we don't normally see too many barn owls here in Minnesota, but they are such an important species worldwide. So this owl uh, lives with us and has now for about 15 years. She's lived with us here at the Raptor Center. So cannot live on her own out in the wild since she was raised by people, but is very good at teaching people about barn owls. I see some <laughs> commentary about somebody who loves barn owls, but all owls are pretty excellent. I agree. I think they're so cool to watch and listen to. I don't know if you can hear tiny, tiny little noises that she's making, normally very, very quiet. But the other main noise that barn owls make, this is a very fun, um, maybe YouTube adventure you and or a trusted adult can go on, um, maybe over lunch or something, is finding out what barn owls sound like. There are some amazing videos of people finding barn owl nests in barns or in other buildings where they maybe were not expecting them to be. And so they find these nests and you can hear the noises and kind of see the kind of threat display that barn owls can do. And the noises that they make sound like somebody screaming. So they can actually make a very, very loud, very intimidating sound, even though they are a pretty tiny raptor. 
I mean, this bird weighs about a pound. So she's not very big, but she has a very loud voice when she does ever make some vocalizations or some calls. So every once in a while, if somebody's here super late at night, maybe coming back from a program or something like that, where they were out kind of late and were driving back, you show up at eight, nine, 10 o'clock after sunset, and you'll hear a barn owl call. And every time it's like, oh my goodness, what was that? And then you remember it's the barn owl who's, that's the time of the night that they're normally awake and active. It's kind of after sunset, it's getting pretty dark out. So it's normally the time that she's the most active. So that's normally when we'll hear some, some vocalizations or some calls. As always, if you want a great easy way to find all the noises that barn owls or other owls make, I'm always a big fan of the allaboutbirds.org website, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have all the different noises that they make in a great library that you can listen to, but there are some excellent videos online. I'll see if I can find one that I really like. But seeing the full display that they do is really fun. I'm gonna see, make sure I didn't miss any questions or anything before, before we sign off and send Whisper back out into her spot. We are getting close-ish to the time of year when we turn on some supplemental heat in her spot. She has a little fake barn that we have constructed for her that has a little heater in it that will turn on once it starts to get a little bit colder since again, normally you don't see them here in Minnesota during the winter. So we wanna make sure that we have a little bit of extra heat. And of course, as it gets really, really cold, she'll spend a little bit more time inside, at least overnight when it's really chilly. But you can see those fluffy feathers should keep her plenty warm here for the next few months still. I don't, don't wanna get ahead of ourselves. All right, I don't see any other questions about barn owls. So I will say thank you all so much for joining us for Reading with Raptors with Whisper the Barn Owl. If you're interested in seeing more of our kind of online activities and all the stuff that we're up to, keep an eye on the Facebook page that we're on right now. Um, you can also check us out at theraptorcenter.org. We have a lot of online programs that are in the works for this school year. So if you're interested in those, check that page out. We have some really exciting virtual field trips and other programs. So give that, give that a look if you are interested in finding out some more online programs that we're doing here at the Raptor Center. But until then, we will see you all next week for more Reading with Raptors. Everyone have a great rest of your day. Bye everyone.